Okay, welcome to week five. Hello everyone, there's a few more people yet to come, hopefully. Um, <clears throat> and today, we're going to talk about and have a little overview of the history of visual effects and animation part one. It wasn't even meant to be part one, but it got to uh, um, a point when I realized I wasn't gonna be able to do it all in one session. So um, I've, uh, it, I've just got to a, a significant place in history where it all hopefully makes sense. Um, and I'll talk about why I use this as a graphic for a lot of things, because I think it, it's, it's important. So a long, long time ago, as all good stories start, Optical toys, shadow plays, magic lanterns, and all these other visual tricks uh, were used by human beings to um, essentially tell stories. Storytelling is important, um, it's important for a lot of reasons. Um, and we've been doing this since the dawn of time. And you know, if you delve into it, you can find lots of examples of um, sequential sort of storytelling, you know. Even, you know, rock art 65 million years ago in, in uh, First Nations history um, uses images to, to tell stories. Um, and so you have to sort of draw, kind of almost draw a line at what point you, 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 you leap in at. So I think it's just important just to sort of say a broad blanket statement that, um, you know, we've been telling stories using sequential images for, you know, thousands of years. Like I said, there, it was, there were lots of places that I, I felt I could have leapt in. You know, I could have talked about the Bayan tapestry. I could have talked about hieroglyphics and, and all different kinds of uh, petroglyphs. Um, but well, let's, let's just, let's leave it at that. Otherwise, uh, it, it becomes kind of less relevant to uh, the world of, of uh, filmmaking. Um, so, we'll leap in at shadow plays and pub trees. So, the <clears throat> these have existed in almost uh, every known civilization, uh, forms of puppet making and, um, and shadow plays. Um, you'll know the, you know, the, the Javanese uh, shadow puppets are, 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 are pretty common and in different parts of uh, Asia have used shadow puppetry. And if this was your main form of storytelling, you, it'd be as absolutely engrossing as, as any kind of modern kind of storytelling because um, it would have seemed incredibly sophisticated and, and alluring. Um, so how does all of these optical toys work? Well, we need to talk about, first of all, this phenomenon called the persistence of vision. And in a nutshell, persistence of vision is an optical illusion that occurs when uh, the, the image of, of an object um, continues to be, have a residual uh, effect on the eye moments after the, uh, the, the image has passed. So in a nutshell, it's just the eye is quicker than the brain. So when the eye sees something, the brain holds uh, a residual image of that. And basically, without this, this uh, phenomenon, there would be no filmmaking. If, we, if there was no persistence of vision, we, I doubt, could actually um, be, you know, in this, in this, in this realm of, of, of um, optical storytelling. And I thought, a good image to explain that it's that thing of you know every time you give anyone a, some, a child a sparkler the first thing we do is wave it around and see that that streak of light that's essentially you know in its in its purest form what persistence of vision is um, and you know there's lots of lots and lots of examples of it I can sort of go and show you all, all of those uh, Victorian toys like Zoe Strobes and, and whatnot that uh, use this to advantage. But I found a really good 
um, contemporary version um, where th this was this was something that I found on Kickstarter um, that this person had found, uh, had made this this uh, uh, essentially a device that has um, that flashes images around the spokes because originally I was looking that to find another example where you know when you you see a helicopter with it, with its blades spinning or you see a bicycle wheel spinning and you you get that that illusion of the of the spokes or the or the blades rotating slowly in the opposite direction and that that strobing thing that's essentially uh, another example of persistence of vision so then i found uh this guy here with his kickstarter thing um this illusion of motion was first described by British physician uh, Peter Roger in 1824, but it's obviously been known a lot since, you know, previous to that. But that's when it first um, uh, was was given its its name. It's a great title too. And <clears throat> throughout this today, I've, I'm going to um, I've put in lots of uh, YouTube links. And because last week was such a disaster trying to show you any kind of YouTube link, there's there's stacks of material there for you to um, uh, I'm just reading Bailey. Bailey, what's that, what's that YouTube link that you've put there? Oh, it's basically you know you know how you're talking about the helicopter. Um, there's this video that went viral like a few years back where um, somebody synced their camera shutter speed like perfectly to the rotor, so. It doesn't even look like it's turning backwards. It just looks like it's frozen. Oh, yeah. So I thought it'd be worth checking out for everybody if they've got a spare moment. But, yeah. I shall, I shall put that into my notes. Um, um, that's cool. And so there's there's lots of this stuff in in, my, in today's lecture notes. So <clears throat> the Victorians were mad for these visual toys. Um, and the... And the, the, the Probably the first one we've all come across is that the idea of when you have a, a double image and you spin it on two elastic bands and you can essentially superimpose the two images together. So there's always the classic one is, you know, a bird cage on one side and a bird on the other. And when you spin it, the, it combines the two image because there's a persistence of vision of both images. And there's a whole bunch of stuff that I can't pronounce. Um, but um, I think probably the the most common one is the uh, the zoetrope um, and obviously the flip book so this is an example of a zoetrope i've actually seen this this is actually this this particular one exists in the uh, uh museum of the moving image in london and i remember going there uh probably uh, would be 30 years ago i suppose and this is actually massive and as you turn it, you can just look through the slots and you, uh, it allows you to see the image. Um, well, in fact, when, when you look through it, the slots are essentially strobing. And so you just see, you can see all of the birds just slowly flap their wings. It's, it's quite amazing. And uh, I was quite pleased to find that example. Uh, but usually they're two dimensional. They're usually just uh, drawn images or, or photographs of um, a sequential motion, like a horse running or someone walking or a ball bouncing. And there's some, there's a, there's some, there's some really good ones around. I found a good example of a, um, a 3D one. I think that's the example I put in there, which is uh, the, uh, of, a t of, of Toy Story. And so it's got all the Toy Story characters, um, Woody and the like, um, and Buzz and whatnot, uh, jumping around. So, yeah. And they've got the traditional one as well. Okay, so this Victorian era was was quite prolific for these uh, these um, leaps in 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 knowledge. Um, there was you know, everyone refers to uh, Edward Mybridge. Um, and his pioneering photographic work on animal locomotion. And he was just really interested in, he was a photographer and he, he became really obsessed and interested in the idea of um, how uh, animals move. And it's interesting when you see, you know, before the age of photography and you see uh, 
pictures of horses, um, they, they never quite knew what the legs were doing. And so you see these odd sort of um, uh, uh, paintings of, of, of horses before this period. And the, and the legs never look quite right. They're always like sticking flat out or, or, or you know, they, they just didn't quite know what was going on. And it was only when you know, the work of, of people like Edward Mybridge were able to take these sequential photographs um, to actually see what was going on. And the interesting thing about these studies is they didn't even have a movie camera. <clears throat> I mean, they barely, I mean, photography had only been around for um, something like about 30, 40 years, 50 years maybe. Um, and so just being able to take an image was, was quite an achievement, but to take sequential images. And they did lots of you know, things like having, um, for, the, for, for, for the moving horse, they had uh, a, a track and they had trip wires. So the horse would, 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 would uh, uh, as the horse passed it, would fire off um, all of the cameras. So it was quite, quite the feat. Um, and <clears throat> it gave us a sense of, you know, and he, he wasn't doing it to make movies. That was actually a secondary thing. He was literally interested in the mechanics of uh, animal movement. And that's called chronophotography. So <clears throat> moving on a little bit, uh, and we're, you know, a few more years, and we're starting to see people perform some more uh, experiments on this idea of the moving image. And so there was this, um, there needed to be sort of several developments in different areas. Obviously photography was new and the issue being that photography was um, uh, something that, that happened on hard inflexible plates sometimes metal plates um it wasn't on the flexible uh film that, that that we all know with the perforated sprockets so they needed to improve upon that so it was the development of of um celluloid and um uh developing uh images on celluloid and the simple idea of being able to progress the film on sequentially. Um, so the advent of mechanisms that uh, could do that th through uh, the use of, of film sprockets. Um, so essentially developing, you know, photographic film, motion cameras. And then once you did all that, <clears throat> there was a period where they had made the sequential images, but they didn't have such a thing as a projector. So they had these sort of um, a period of these, these devices which were single person uh, projectors. You had to put your head in a box um, to experience what was going on. And they only had you know, a few seconds of motion. So once all that came together and it was the, uh, the Lumia brothers that f sort of brought all of that together in about 1895 and F had the first uh, successful um, screening of, of, of moving images. Um, and most of their images only lasted for a few seconds, um, or a minute at most. Um, and that became this, this, this huge hit. But it was really much, pretty much a kind of a, uh, a frivolous uh, kind of amusement type thing. And um, I've got some uh, some footage here of their first films. It's amazing it even still exists. Um, and they were literally uh, really mundane stuff. Like they 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 had a factory where where they produced their they were, they had a photography business, and they um, were filming their workers leaving the factory. So this is the you know the, one of the earliest examples of of the moving image. 1895 and then they've got this kind of this gag where this where this uh, gardener is watering his, his, his vegetables and uh, uh, somebody stands on the hose and he does that classic thing where he looks down the hose and they steps off it and squirts him in the face high entertainment of, it, of its day and um, 
Moving on a little bit further, this is when it gets really interesting. This is where we, we uh, meet Georges Millet, and I spoke about him briefly last week. And uh, Georges Millet was uh, an impresario. He, uh, he was you know, interested in the theatre and, and, and storytelling and, uh, and all of those um, illusions, uh, those Victorian illusions that were around at the time. And he was just fascinated with the whole thing. And he experienced the, uh, the Lumiere Brothers um, uh, show, show projections. Uh, screenings and he he was like wow that's amazing he tried to buy the equipment from them but he, they wouldn't sell it because it was you know it was their sideshow and so he went and had uh, commissioned his own and that's where and he decided to you know he bought bought a movie camera and he uh, he was already uh, putting on uh, theatre um, and um, started you know making short films. Um, and he, he sort of made some interesting kind of, uh, sort of advancements in narrative storytelling. Br the, the Lumia brothers didn't really tell stories. It was literally, you know, it was, it was a, it was a sideshow thing of, oh, look, look, we've got, we've, we've managed to make photographs move. And it was, you know, people, wow, people, but Millet took it a stage further and, um, he cited as um, the story goes that um, he had this this you know obviously it's mechanical so he had this hand cranked movie camera and at some point the mechanism jammed and of course you know the you know the the people that you were filming carried on moving and a, you know, a moment or two later the uh, the the, um, the camera started working again. And of course, when he developed the film, it looked like the people had vanished or, 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 or sort of transported themselves from one part of the scene to another. So this kind of got him thinking. It was, a, it was pure accident. And he went, oh, my God, this, 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 this sort of stop motion kind of effect. And so it's that happy accident thing when he went, oh, I reckon I can use this. And so he did that in a lot of his work of, of getting people to vanish and do different things. Um, he made over 500 films and, um, you know, two of the important films was The Trip to the Moon, 1902, and The Impossible Voyage. And they're all very kind of surreal, sort of Jules Verne uh, type of um, um, science fiction films, that sort of Victorian steampunk idea of science fiction. They were really fascinated by it. So they were, they were essentially, you know, when we look at them, they look quite old fashioned, but they were essentially modernists. You know, they were, they were looking to, you know, it was at the tail end of the industrial revolution. So they were, they were really intrigued with, uh, inventions I mean the Victorian age was full of inventions and they were constantly making advancements and so they were they were absolutely fascinated by that so of course their storytelling was going to be riddled with um, those kinds of kinds of science fiction type ideas and adventures and this idea that you could um, essentially travel to the moon and, and that the space rocket was was no more kind of complicated than than a steam train um, and that they could you know you could, you could literally sort of put a whole bunch of people in it and in this rocket and and, and, and fire it into the moon and you know meet all of the uh, all the people that were on the moon so it's really, it's a great film if you haven't seen it it's it's there it's it really is I would urge you to check out all of these YouTube clips over the next week or so because they're really important. It really lays a uh, foundation of your understanding. And, you know, I, I, I'm just a geek and I love, I love my history. And um, I love understanding how things fit together and the sequence of when things fit together. And, and, and writing these, these, um, these lectures has been great because it's been able, allowed me to kind of go back and, and revisit this stuff. I remember going through all of this when I was 
um, at uni, but it's been a while since I've, I've, I've kind of put it back in context again. Um, so I think it's really important for you to, to go and watch all of this stuff if, you, if you're not familiar with it. Hey, Brittany, didn't see you sneak in there. How are you going? Hey, good. Good, thank you. How are you? I'm all right. I'm having a good snuck time. Snuck in too. I'm sorry? I snuck in too. Hey, Sarah, how are you doing? I'm good, thanks. I was, looking I was about to say something before, but I didn't want to interrupt. I was just going to say that um, a lot of science fiction writers are like psychics. I think. They're are you going to say that? <laughs> <laughs> I knew you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to say next? I don't know. <laughs> that? <laughs> Sorry. Wormhole or what is it? Rabbit hole. Sorry. Rabbit hole. Oh, my God. So many rabbit holes today. It's amazing. I've been spent all week researching this stuff and it's just like, oh my God, it's too much. So um, another pioneer at that time. So whilst Georges Millet was widely credited for accidentally stumbling upon this whole idea of, of, of stop action shot where you, you know, the camera jams and you, something happens and the camera goes again and there's this sort of sort of little kind of snap action thing. There was this really interesting short film. Um, it only goes for about, I don't know, 30 seconds. And it was made by a guy called Alfred Clark. And he actually did it um, before George Millay um, by a couple of years. And it's, and it's, it's not, has, doesn't have quite the sophistication, but it's, it was the, um, it was the, uh, execution is a weird thing to go and make a film. You've got all this technology and, you know, you know, to them that was amazing technology and they decide to make, you know, a 30 second <laughs> film on the beheading of Mary Queen of Scots, which is a, a ludicrous thing to do. And the way they did it was, you know, they had all of the actors there. You can see in this shot, this is, this is the moment before they, they did it. So they had all of the actors, you know, dressed up as soldiers and the executioner and Mary Queen of Scots walks in and kneels down and puts her head on the chopping block. And literally, you know, the guy's got the ax in his hand and just before he swings the ax, they just sort of say to everyone, right, don't move, don't move. And the, you know, the actress gets up, walks away and they obviously, you know, put this um, really bad mannequin in 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 her in her place and then go right action and they swing the, you know they sort of start the camera and then they chop her head off now at that time that would have been amazing you know go, oh my god how they've done this it's incredible and we would kind of get blown you know they would have been really blown away by it and to us now it looks like really really crap but um fascinating all the all the same so go and check go and check that out that's that's hilarious and it's really funny because you can sort of, the moment before they do it, you go, oh, that's not very good. And it's even some of the actors move about a bit as well. But, you know, it's like they really um, suspend belief with this. Um, so then, you know, things are you know, like, it's the turn of the last century. And things, and they're really kind of getting quite uh, sophisticated with this. And there's sort of, you know, for the first time, I guess, understanding narrative storytelling through the medium of film. And they are, they're thinking, what kinds of stories can they tell and how can they make it more believable? And the technology is getting better, like it's, it's, it's leaping ahead all the time. And so um, they wanted to tell this um, this uh this 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 story of a, of, a, of a train robbery and so they wanted to make it look as you know the stage look like the scenery was passing passing by the windows of the train and the way they did that was by essentially creating an in-camera mat where they um were able to block out the windows when they, when they exposed the film they did it using using just using um using masks and then we're able to re-expose the film using other footage um, and so you know in 1903 
you know, the first example of uh, an income camera map. I've put a little bit more detail down here, filmed in 1903 by Thompson, Ed, Thomas Edison, you know, the guy that in, invented the light bulb uh, and invented lots of other things, lots of, you know, lots of great innovations at the time. Um, and yeah, so he was into filmmaking. So again, you've got the YouTube clip, go and check that out. It's really interesting. So getting into animation, um, this is a film, 1906. It's all of this stuff's really happening really quite rapidly. There's all these, there's like these innovations are really starting to um, speed up. And so, and the curiosity was amazing. So, you know, of, of they were just sort of really trying to push the envelope to what's possible now because the, equi the equipment was getting better. Um, so, 1906, uh, they thought, can we make drawings move? And so, they created the first stop motion um, animated, I guess. Um, uh, Films, it would have been, I guess, the, the first uh, cartoon, and they did it using a chalkboard, and so they would have obviously just, you know, inc you know, had a rostrum camera and incrementally just moved, moved the drawings and re redid them, and, the, and it, it gets, and um, yeah, go, go and check it out. I wish I could be showing you this stuff, but um, the, the clips are there, so please go and check them out. It's fascinating stuff, and it's just part of your. Um, ongoing understanding of the medium and, and sort of knowing where you sit in history is really important. So it's and it's it's just just gives you gives you lots of perspective. The glass shot. So people are starting to make more and more films, and the sophistication is improving significantly. And so. This is a this is this is a movie that was was made in 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 California, and this is by a guy called Norman Dawn, and he wanted to uh, film a um, a Spanish a, a traditional Spanish mission of of California, but he couldn't find anything that was completely authentic or appropriate because there was all this. They had, you know, things like, you know, um, uh, telephone uh, poles and um, uh, ele electricity poles and all of this, all, you know, these bits of ephemera that were just knocking around, bits of stuff that weren't, you know, wouldn't normally be there if you wanted to do uh, the shot. Um, and so he thought, he did this really inventive thing of suspending a piece of glass in front of the camera and shooting through the glass. And so that way he was able to paint scenery on that glass, which um, filled in the, uh, and covered up the bits of the, uh, the scene that he didn't want to show. And um, this idea of the glass shot, you know, it's, 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 it's sort of lasted for years. I remember when, I was um, at uni, a mate of mine was a scenic artist, and I used to help out with, help, help him out occasionally, especially on, you know, during term, term breaks. Uh, and also the money was really good, because I thought, you know, the film money was always really good. And I remember working on this glass shot, and absolutely fascinated by it. And what we did is, it was this, um, it was this warehouse scene, and the actors had to, and, and the camera was high up on this gantry looking down through this warehouse, and they wanted to have um, a different kind of ceiling to this, to this warehouse. And they also wanted to have a lot, of, uh, a lot more scenery. And I remember this warehouse just being full of boxes with this kind of high ceiling. And so um, uh, help my mate, uh, draw out and paint this glass shot which was literally just shooting through the sheet of glass and it was bizarre because i remember thinking at the time this will never look right it will just it, i just couldn't see how it was going to be believable that you were going to match this piece of glass in front of the scene and how it was all going to come together but it's exactly it absolutely worked and it was only such it was such a short scene it took us all day to paint um 
but it absolutely worked. It was incredible. So there you go. The glass shot invented in 1907 to create scenery that's not really there. Trick of the eye. This Wouldn't is that be a shot like a a reflection or a... no, nothing, no, no, nothing, nothing. It's, it's amazing. You have to uh, you have to get onto a certain so angle so it doesn't or something. Straight on. Just yep. Straight okay. On. Um, and the thing is, at the time, because the cameras um, are not there, because the cameras are pretty expensive, and they, you know, they they they've got to be set up by a technical sort of people. Um, I remember there was uh, a um, a little. It was just this lens, like little, like a little telescope, and it was set up exactly like the camera. How the camera was going to be with the same focal length, and it was just sitting there on the tripod, and we were just keep going up and looking through this 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 telescope. And then using um, China grants to sketch it in, and so you'd have to kind of look through it and 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 use uh, perspective strings and and whatnot uh, to just draw it out and then paint it on. And it's you think this is so crappy, this will never work, but it does. It's quite good. And you know, was you know, glass shots were the the you know the industry standard way of. Um, putting in scenery that uh, would have been too expensive and too difficult to um, generate any other way. And you see it all the time in, in films. Now, maybe, maybe back then, you know, we sort of think um, we, we believed a lot more, maybe. It's funny when you see, you can, you can pick it. When you see films, you go, oh, that's a little bit too crisp and clean because, you know, you know, the perspective and the colours are great, but it's always the... Um, Sometimes it's just the clarity of those older films that just makes it look not quite believable. This is an interesting thing that I came across, and I wasn't familiar with this guy. Interesting, called Arthur Melvin Cooper, British photographer. Um, and in 1908, he created this, <clears throat> this fantasy <coughs> stop frame animation. And it's essentially, it's a story of a, uh, a boy goes to a toy shop and he's looking at all these these toys it's a silent movie and um, he's kind of you know being a small boy kind of excited about all these small toys and then uh, his you know his mother buys them for him so he's obviously wealthy um, goes home plays with his toys and then at night he goes to bed he lays down in his bed and then you see the dream sequence and that's what this scene is here that I'm showing you. All of his toys come to life. And it's this bizarre, surreal adventure that all the toys uh, have. And it's, it's quite incredible. I didn't think there was anything like that at the time. Um, it produced over 300 films between 1896 and 1915. And estimated 36 were all or in part animated it's quite amazing so dreams of toyland definitely definitely go on, well watch them all but in particular watch that one because i hadn't seen i thought i'd seen all of this stuff uh but i hadn't seen this so i was quite excited about seeing something new ah right now now we're getting there um windsor mckay cartoonist he was a he was a uh, a very, very established um, newspaper cartoonist. And he was also a little bit of a showman. And he was, you know, he would, he would do these, um, these, these talks where he would stand in front of people in, 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 in the theatre and, 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 and draw on these big pads. And he was, he was used to putting on a bit of a show. And... He got inspired by looking at some of this early technology, you know, flip books and, you know, Victorian zoetrobes and, and all of those other uh, Victorian optical, optical toys. And, he, and, you know, and, 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 and films were just starting to kind of happen. And, you know, being such an accomplished um, cartoonist, he was interested to see 
if he could make his cartoons move. He had this really famous um, uh, cartoon called Little Nemo in Slumberland. And it's, it's quite surreal, quite bizarre. Looks, if you saw it in a, in, a, in a contemporary sense, it would kind of hold its own because it's quite... Um, Sid Bailey, take care. He's, he's, he sent me a little private yes. Thanks, mate. Um, when you see Windsor Mackay's Little Nemo, it's, it's really holds its own in quite a contemporary way. Is anyone familiar with Little Nemo and Slumberland, by the way? Anyone heard of it? I've, I've yeah. seen it once. Okay. But that was a while ago. Yeah, look, it, it, I was familiar with it, but I, it was really good to go back and revisit it. Um, and, you know, the, the, it's, it's actually quite weird and odd and surreal. So, um, really quite important. So, Windsor Mackay was a really important figure in so much that, one, he drew really, really well, but also he was quite significant in taking animation to that next level. Um, that he, you know, he had expressive characters and appealing characters that, you know, that, that, that were, became characters in their own. They weren't just this, this curious oddity. Um, he did this interesting thing a few years later in 1914. Interesting. Does anyone know what happened in 1914? Something quite... Titanic, or was that 1912? <laughs> I think, I think it was a bit before then, Titanic. I think it was 1912, so no. 1914, First World War breaks out. So it's a major kind of time, but you know, he's, he's working in, in the States, so they're a little bit removed from this, but it's, you know, what relevance it has comes up in a second. So here we are, Windsor Mackay. He's a newspaper cartoonist. And you know he's a he's a bit of a rock star in 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 that realm, and um, but he's also a bit of a showman because he's been doing this thing where he's been drawing these these live drawings and you know turning that into a bit of a, a stage show. So what he does is he he comes up with this this character of Gertie the dinosaur. And he makes this animated cartoon of Gertie the Dinosaur. And he does this really amazing thing when you think about it, considering animation was really, really in its infancy. He sort of did this thing that no one had, you know, it was so far ahead of its time in many ways that he projected his animated cartoon onto a screen, but he actually walked on stage at the time and interacted with his cartoon. And so he obviously had it all timed out. So he'd walk on stage and say, oh, let me introduce you to Gertie. And hey, Gertie, why don't you come out? And Gertie would stick her head from behind a rock and sort of look around the, the audience. He says, oh, it's okay, don't be shy. And Gertie would dart behind the rock and say, come on, come out and meet the people. And Gertie would walk out from between the rock. It's hard to imagine, but this absolutely blew people's minds. And they couldn't separate illusion from reality. And people sort of screamed and got out their seats and ran away. And it's, it's bizarre, because when you look at it now, it's like it's, this, it's, you know, it's black and white, it's pretty jittery, it's not, it's not great at all. But, you know, people were just blown away by this. Um, and he, so he did, so this is a poster for, um, for his stage show, but then he needed, he also made another version, um, which went on general release without him. So he sort of did the stage show on the screen. So he, he was being filmed saying, hey, Gertie, come out, blah, blah, blah. And, um, 
So there was a the full the film full film version plus the stage show version. But you know you can see it from this poster, the greatest animal act in the world. She's a scream because when he pulls this dinosaur out, people thought we just thought it was real. They go, oh my god, freaked out. Check it out; it's really good. The third film that he made was really important, and again, it's it's another film that I was really familiar with um, in terms of its historical importance. Um, for those that you remember your history, um, there was a, a single act that brought America into the First World War and therefore um, ended the First World War, um, was the sinking of uh, a British ship called the Lusitania. And the, why it was so important is because this ship was traveling between New York and Liverpool in the UK. And um, it was a civilian ship and essentially it was, it was bringing over civilian passengers and Americans didn't feel that they were part of this uh, faraway conflict that was happening in France um, and different parts of Europe. And um, there were predominantly uh, British people on, on, on board this boat, but there were also about 200 Americans and the, the German Navy sunk this boat um, and it sunk, you know, just off the coast of, of Ireland in the middle of the night, quite sort of, you know, um, quietly, no, no one really observed it. Uh, there were no photographs. Um, it just, you know, it sunk within 12 minutes um, and or 15 minutes and it was, you know, you know from the, it was torpedoed and it just vanished. And there were a number of news reports. And the thing is that the Americans were really um, um, incensed by this, that they had been, you know, violated. It was, it was almost in some ways a little bit like, um, you know, the 9-11. The, the that it was uh, this moment in history that changed everything. But unlike 9-11, there were no film cameras. It just happened. Uh, the only um, um, sort of uh, evidence we have it, of it are survivors that described it. Why this film is important is that there were a number of illustrations that were drawn and went into the newspapers and people were incensed. But Winsor Mackay, he animated it and told the story. And this was the thing that really changed um, public perception in America because there were a lot of people that didn't want to get involved. It's, it's not our war. We, we don't understand it. It's just between, you know, um, you know, uh, the, the royal families of Europe, bloody, you know, uh, you know, got, had got themselves into this arm race. It's between, you know, the, the British and the Kaiser and all of that. And they, they, they didn't want to know. And this one act brought them into the war. And it was the telling of the story. It was this animated movie that really made people understand. Again, please go and watch this because stylistically it's really interesting, but it's also has some drawn visual effects. And it's when you see the people jumping off the boat and the explosions, it, it's actually quite emotive even now um, to think about that at the time would have been quite, quite, quite um, emotional. So, um, yeah, I'd love to know what you guys think of that. I love this thing here. You know, The Sinking of the Lusitania, an amazing moving pen picture by Winsor Mackay. Universal films, universal pictures. Right. 
the birth of the movie business. So, you know, up until now, there's, there's technology is, 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 is moving and there's, you know, there's lots of these short little films. Um, but up until now, film has been, has still been very much a, 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 a curiosity and an oddity. And the films were quite short. Um, and, you know, people didn't really go to the movies on any large scale. Um, you know, they were, they were still very much into, um, you know, sort of pop, mass popular entertainment at this stage was pretty much in the form of vaudeville stage entertainment. So vaudeville is different from, say, a play. So theatre has been around for, for centuries, thousands of years. Um, but vaudeville is more of a, it, it's a little bit more, I guess, uh, light entertainment. It's a little bit like the variety show. It's, you know, uh, sort of characters coming on and, and, and doing crazy little acts and, um, you know, you know, juggling puppies and kind of crazy stuff um and that was the dominant working class uh form of entertainment and you know i guess cinema was seen as a um uh, uh an, ad an addition to that it wasn't taking over but from about 1910 onwards the film industry became a viable industry in its own right. So, you know, there's people like Charlie Chaplin making his first movie. He was a vaudeville performer. He was, you know, he was, he was traveling around the country, both, you know, in the UK and America um, in a, in a traveling show, you know, doing kind of, you know, light entertainment. Um, People like Laurel and Hardy doing this, exactly the same thing. They were tra they were traveling entertainers, um, and you know, really successful in their own way. But they weren't, you know, they weren't the, the, the film stars that we know now. Um, but in, in about 1914, 1915, they made the transition from from vaudeville um, to making films. And that was, you know, the turning point of the industry. Um, Buster Keaton. Um, I talked a little bit about Buster Keaton last week. Um, and I've always been a massive fan of, of Buster Keaton. Um, he was notorious and, 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 and renowned, I guess, and was both notorious. He was renowned for performing his own stunts and writing his own visual gags. Um, incredibly dangerous stuff. You know, that and all that classic stuff of the front of buildings falling over and he'd be standing where the window was and like, a, and, and it, like his whole thing was about this, this, these acrobatic stunts. When you look at them, you think, oh my God, that's incredibly dangerous. And there was no special effects then. And that's why I've really made a point of putting this into this presentation, because you know, this is all about the film industry. It's all about, yeah, yes, we talk about animation, which is kind of one aspect to it, but then there's this visual effects thing. The thing is about Buster Keaton, is he had all these ideas and it would have been just too expensive and too slow to do this stuff using, you know, their current understanding of visual effects. You know, it would just, you know, it would just be too hard. So he used to just do it live. Um, and his co comedic timing is extraordinary. His, his way of hold of, of, of mime, um, of holding his body is, is phenomenal. And 
I've always had, can I tell you, can I share, it feels a bit weird, I'll, I'll share a little story. My connection to Buster Keaton is this, see if I can pull this off. Um, Buster Keaton's last movie, his, think about his first film was in 1914, 1915. And that was, you know, the heyday of all of this stuff, silent movies. And his last film, and his career kind of petered out once, it's that thing of once talking movies came in, all of these silent actors like Chaplin and, and Laurel and Hardy, they, their, their, their careers were just, were just over and, you know, you know they just, just didn't translate into, into the talkies very well. Buster Keaton was the same. His career kind of fell over. But he made his last movie in 1966. And that movie was called A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. Now, the, the guy I worked for, this guy called Richard Williams, you know, the, you know this, 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 this legendary animator that I worked with, and he made the movie The Thief and the Cobbler, which I'll bang on, talk about endlessly, and it's the movie that I tell other animators I worked on, they lose their mind and say, oh my God, you worked on that, whatnot. Um, Richard Williams, in 1966, did the uh, the animated titles for Buster Keaton's movie, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And the movie that I worked on, Richard Williams would always talk about Buster Keaton and he would show Buster Keaton films and he would talk and use Buster Keaton as examples. The main character in the film that I worked on was based on Buster Keaton's character in A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum. And part of his character was, he was always followed around by these little flies. And I remember seeing A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, and I saw the Buster Keaton character, and I went, oh my God, that's the character that was in The Thief and the Cobbler. And he's followed around by these, these, these little, little flies. Here's the other thing, I don't know. The, um, the building that I worked in was in Camden Town. And um, the building, oddly enough, was called The Forum. I went, isn't that weird? Like, you know, there's this, this film, a funny thing happened on the way to The Forum. It's based on Buster Keaton. It's his last movie. Richard Williams did the title for it. Many years later, his studio is based in a place called The Forum. I'd love to, if I ever ever get to, uh, to meet Dick Williams again, I'd love to ask him that question and, and ask him about that whole Buster Keaton connection. But it's that kind of, um, that Kevin Bacon thing, that seven de degrees of separation for Kevin Bacon. I feel like I'm somehow connected to Buster Keaton. I don't know, I can't see your faces. I hope I pulled that off. I think it's a really interesting story. I've entertained myself, you might have all just gone. You might have all just gone to the bathroom, I don't know. Love to hear what you think. Okay, enough of my self-indulgence. Let's move on with the development of uh, visual effects and animation. Now, every week we've talked about this thing called rotoscoping, yeah? And um, I've always sort of, I, my understanding of rotoscoping isn't the, the kind of the, the modern digital understanding of of rotoscoping. Back in my day, rotoscoping was a process of literally drawing each frame from live action. So essentially tracing live action and, and copying it. So copying, you know, basically copying the movement and, you know, it's, it's, like, it's, the, it's kind of the analog equivalent of, of motion capture. Well, in 1915, uh, there was a, an animation studio uh, on the east coast of the States uh, in New York um, called the Fleischer Studios, run by Max and Dave Fleischer, mostly, mostly known as, as, as Max Fleischer, as the, the guy that was best known for this. And they were huge innovators, um, and they were, they were always making sort of little technical advancements in, 
in you know the art of filmmaking and they basically invented the uh, a rotoscoping device and there's a picture of it there and you know they would project each frame onto a piece of ground glass or a piece of paper and they could you know registered paper little, little registration marks so that they could essentially copy live action so it was a way of cheating animation and when you see rotoscoped animation it's got this really slightly strange look to it um real animators we're just such snobs we go oh my god that's rotoscope that's terrible um and remember there were a lot of people who used to, used to love rotoscoping when i was at uni and we just go oh no it's awful you, you you you're a it's a dirty word but you know the Fleischer Studios, they pioneered rotoscoping and they used it in a number of their uh, their movies. They did things like Gulliver's Travels, where they had a real actor that was the big kind of giant in, in Gulliver's Travels, Gulliver. And um, all the little people were, were animated. So massive innovation, doing great, great stuff. They also made Coco the Clown, Betty Boop, you'd have heard of, obviously Popeye. Um, and in 1940, their, their last ever movie was they got the rights to animate an obscure cartoon character called Superman. And they blew all of their dough animating Superman. It's got a great look to it, but it basically sent them bust. Who'd have thought? Who'd have, who thought they would, you know, get to that point? And, you know, there we have it. Okay, 1919. So the craft of animation has really developed significantly. You know, we've now got a film industry, people are in the habit of going to see the movies uh, rather than just going to theatres to watch vaudeville or plays. Um, and we have Felix the Cat, the first anthropomorphic cartoon character created for the silent film era. So essentially he was a movie star. Um, he was an animated movie star, massive. And he was popular, you know, through the whole silent period from 1920 to 1929. Um, and he had these, these, he was, he, he, interestingly enough, the thing about Felix the Cat is he, and there, there was this real sense of adventure and suspension of belief where he would do these things like, um, if he wanted to look through a, a hole in the wall, he would do this thing like there's a scene in this movie where he's got this, this, um, this wine barrel and he kind of pulls the tap out of the wine barrel and throws it away. And he gets the whole wine, wine barrel and he turns around and puts it on the wall and then stands up and looks through the hole. Completely bizarre. It's like... It's amazing stuff that they just have that level of invention that I don't know. I think I think it's sort of missing. I think we just don't have enough silliness. But there you go, the first animated film star. Wasn't a lot of opium taken back in that day? <laughs> I think so. They want something. The funny thing is, drugs at that time, there was a very different attitude to drugs that they were believe it or not you know i know we've got there's massive drug problems and whatnot but and you know and you shouldn't talk lightly about about them that it's not, I'm not in any way i'm getting all teachery and way of being away disclaimer <laughs> yeah i don't advise you go and smoke opium at all ever or anything um but back in those days they didn't have a great understanding of the harm that drugs did. So there was a lot of opium and there was all these sort of kind of crazy things like laudanum, you know, you know, um, C.S. Lewis was a, was, was a, a massive uh, partaker in those um, psychotropic uh, types of, of, of drugs. So yeah, they were kind of out there. They really were quite, quite trippy. Um, you know, the 1920s were a wild time, I think, I've got this hypothesis that we, we've actually become quite conservative and quite restrained. Um, and we're getting worse. Yeah, I, think. I, think, I think people, 
we are a lot more prudish. I was watching um, something on Netflix the other day. Um, have you guys seen Peaky Blinders? No, I've heard about it. Ish, I don't. Yeah, it was set during. I think the- Mark Polyblank did an episode. He worked on an episode of it. Really? Apparently, it's on his um, on his whatever it is, IMDb page. Cool. I'll have to ask him about that. But in in that in that in that series, they're um, they take a lot of drugs, and um, all of these things that were taking opium was massive because they're all damaged from the first world war the 20s were interesting because it was i love it from a design perspective but i love that kind of that breakaway of thinking that they they had in the 1920s that it was the birth of modernism you look at architecture breaks away from everything you've seen before music is completely different um uh, Painting, art, sculpture, literature, filmmaking. Of course, filmmaking was brand new. It was in its infancy. But everything, 1920s, was an amazing period of, of thought. Um, you know, so, yeah, you know, where, how do I get to this point? Anyway, 1920s, Steamboat <laughs> Willie. What's that, Sarah? It was drugs. <laughs> oh, right, man. Yeah, that's right. Drugs. <laughs> Don't take drugs. Drugs are bad. So, 90... And see, then we get to the, the, the 1928. Walt Disney. Walt Disney was actually quite a straight guy. And you can sort of see that in his work, that he, that he was, you know, he... he like all the Fleischer stuff was like wacky, wacky, wacky shit. A lot of the stuff that I've talked to you about so far has been this kind of crazy stuff. Walt Disney was, was, was quite straight. Um, and um, Steamboat Willie, right? So Walt Disney was, you know, one of the star. He, he had a number of failed little studios. And eventually, you know, he got to the point where, we, where we've got Walt, the, the Disney studios. With, it, with his brother Roy, and um, he'd made these sort of little kind of little kind of short things, and he saw a movie called The Jazz Singer with Al Jolson, the first um, kind of movie with what you'd call synchronized um, sound. And what I mean by that, you know, movies used to come along with movie scores, so like you know. Sort of, they'd have orchestras or people playing along to the movie, so it gave them some sort of sound. But it was the first time that uh, sound came along and it was synchronized with a film. So that was the jazz singer. And so basically, Walt Disney went, Oh, that's kind of cool. I want to make a movie that's, you know, the, the animated equivalent of the jazz singer. We've got this new kind of technology here. And it's it's all about sound and syncopated sound and musical scores, and so I made Steamboat Willie, which is the first cartoon to feature um, fully post-produced soundtrack, which essentially set it apart from every other cartoon. And there's lo- there's loads of things you can say about Steamboat Willie, and you know he stole the idea, and there was um, this idea that it was a, a live action. Um, uh, idea. He st- Walt Disney stole all his ideas. He was he's the, he's you know he was the he was the master thief of 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 creativity, and we can talk about that forever. But we'll be here all night. Okay, talking. I'm just kind of keep leaping back because I kept on going down uh, animation rabbit holes, uh, quite literally. Um, but there's also other technical advancements that happened during the 1920s that really are too important to ignore. So there's um, a whole bunch of things like, you know, using rear projection. So if you, instead of, you know, if you wanted to put some actors into an environment, having 
rear projection was a great way to if you want to put someone on the deck of a boat you know how do you how do you do that it's you know if you shoot it live it's all it's all problematic um you know so this idea of having mats and rear projection um this thing called an optical printer was invented and basically an optical printer was is a, is a, is a, is a, is a simple device it's a way of when you've shot some film you can um create masks and hand paint masks to cut out pieces of that film and you know an optical printer like the name suggests means that you can you can essentially duplicate the film and if you mask out areas of that with other pieces of film you can literally kind of cut things out and re um uh composite them uh, against other backgrounds and it was just a really simple piece of technology hopefully this kind of gives a bit of an idea but essentially in a nutshell it's basically how film used to be composited before before digital um, and that was that came along in in the in the 1920s that and the idea of traveling maps and what I mean by a traveling map is a map that travels along with another piece of piece of uh, um, film. So instead of uh, being still, um, how do I put it? It's, you know, if, if, I, if I'm sit, sitting here and really nice and still, you can cut me out. But if, if I'm moving or the background's moving, that's a traveling mat. So it's, it becomes a lot more complicated. Okay. Te another technical advancements. The Lost World. This is an interesting movie. 1925. Again, it's silent. Sound hasn't really happened yet. It's, it's a little bit before Steamboat Willie. Uh, the Lost World is a 1925 silent monster adventure film uh, adapted from Arthur Conan Doyle's uh, novel of the same time. Interestingly enough, um, it features the pioneering stop motion and special effects work of a guy called Willis O'Brien. Now, Willis O'Brien also worked on King Kong um, a few years later, um, but it was his, the first time stop motion had been used um, effectively to um, create some, uh, some fanciful um, worlds. You can't go past Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Has anyone, have you guys seen Metropolis? No. I haven't. Every, <laughs> I think it's, it's, a, it's a rite of passage for every um, art student and, and film student. And I remember we, we were sat through it um, when I was at art school. And I remember just going, Oh my God, this is so painful. I hate it. Um, Cause it was this sort of German expressionist thing and it's kind of really drags on, but it's again, you should see it. It's really important. Um, there was a version of it, uh, a modern version where they took the original footage and they colored it and they put a soundtrack to it that was made in the 1980s. So maybe do yourself a favor, see that one, not the original. Um, it was a modernist masterpiece. Nothing like it had ever been seen before. And essentially it's just set in this futuristic urban dystopia where there's essentially, um, you've got your, your, you know, your enslaved working classes and then you've got your ruling classes. And it's this utopian idea of, of kind of bringing them together and smashing the machine. Um, it's sort of, yeah, it's great. Um, but there was a lot of um, uh, innovative filmmaking techniques that were used because, you know, there were big lavish sets and there were, you know, you know um, uh, animated mats and there's all this stuff going on in the background that were, were groundbreaking pieces of technology, of course, made in Germany. And, you know, the Germans are just really, they're great innovators. They're, they're, they're great at just inventing stuff and, and taking an idea and making it better. So there's a lot of uh, technical innovation on this film 
So it's just a landmark in, in movie making. So if you're in this industry, you need to have said, seen this at least once. Uh, so go and look it up. Okay, 1927, a kind of a landmark moment in filmmaking, The Jazz Singer, 1927. It's a musical drama and it's the first feature length motion picture with synchronized recorded music store. It also had, um, uh, you know, lips uh, synced singing and speech and you know, it, was, it, it just blew people away. And it was kind of uh, a watershed moment. There was the end of the silent film. So there was this period of time from 1927 till the early 1930s where, where essentially kind of the talkies took over and it ended people's careers. That were, there, were, there were people that were silent film, film actors that were massive, you know, as big as any kind of um, celebrity that you'd know now. Suddenly, it's gone, it's all over. You know, people like, you know, people like Buster Keaton, Charlie Chaplin, their, their careers were, went down the toilet. So it changed everything. Al Johnson, very famous for, in fact, does anyone, can anyone tell me what Al Johnson, Al Johnson was famous for? Was he a jazz singer? He could sing very, very well. He was a singer, a performer. He did a particular kind of performance that I, is, you're unlikely to see in this day and age, thankfully. He wasn't the fartest, was he? No, that was me. No, there was a, uh, it was Charlie Chapman era. There was a guy who um, considered himself an, a fartist. The Lapita Man. He could, yes, he could play instruments with his bottom. <laughs> Smoke cigarettes, all sorts of stuff. <laughs> oh, no, you could probably still get away with that. No, much worse. Al Johnson was famous for blackface. Oh. And all of his movies, are that, you know, was that kind of like doing all that kind of stuff with the kind of the makeup, the black, and he's like, eh, 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 no good. Um, but, yeah, Al Johnson. Uh, and I don't think he does any blackface in this, actually. I think that's kind of... Um, not sure. I have to go. I'd have to go back and revisit it. But yeah, watershed moment. And he he comes on. He says this thing. This 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 famous line. You ain't heard anything yet. You you ain't heard nothing yet. Okay. With a solution comes a problem. So you've suddenly got sound. It's the early 1930s and it's like, oh my God, you're losing people, losing their minds. That they, you've, you know, filmmakers have got all of this, this technology. They've got sound. Um, but it's causing them a problem because in the past, the movies you saw before, a lot of them could be made out in the wild. And it didn't really matter if you had sound, you know, sort of ambient sound knocking around. But all of a sudden, it meant that movies had to be made in sound stages where you could control that stuff. And so because of that, they had to use a lot more special effects. So instead of just putting someone on a train and filming it, you can't do that. You've got to fake it. So all of a sudden, um, that kind of new technology meant that, that it kind of pushed the, the visual technology a lot further. Um, another important thing happened in the 1930s from 19, you, you guys understand 1929, the Great Depression, um, which is a, a landmark sort of moment that defined the last century. In some ways, you know, you could arguably say that is the, the, you know, kind of we're still reeling from uh, the effects of that in, 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 in some ways. It's like a ripples in a pond. But 1929, there was this the stock market crash. And um, basically, you know, it did this weird thing where the film industry was the only industry on the planet that boomed. Everything else went into 
a depression, like a massive recession, but the, but the film industry absolutely boomed. And it was the only industry that did that. And the reason being was because people were so miserable, but they would do anything to escape from their miseries. So that was a really a driving sort of socioeconomic um, factor that um, uh, progressed the film industry. Um, an important movie, King Kong, um, 1933. Um, again, this stop motion animator, Willis O'Brien, uh, was, uh, was used on this, an iconic movie. And it was, it got voted recently as still in the top 30 of all time films of all time. Bad English, I know, but anyway. Uh, so still a really, really important movie. Looking back on the different, I mean, this is where I'm sort of diversifying a little bit. I'm sort of looking at technological breakthroughs. I'm looking at the types of films that have been made, different kinds of technology that's around, um, but also the different different um, applications of films. So that we've, you know, you've got the the the, the live action effects stuff. You've got the whimsical stuff. And you've got this this sort of lower brow sort of type of of movie, this the animated short. So you know the 1930s were just a boom time for that. Um, you know because suddenly you've got you know the, the Disney Corporation, you've got Fleischer's, um, uh, and a whole range of other animation studios that are creating um, really. Uh, highly polished uh, pieces of animation, you know, from 1929 onwards, they're essentially, you know, through the whole of the thirties, Disney went into making kind of two different kinds of, of, of animated productions. They had what they called the silly symphonies. So you've got, you know, characters like, you know, Mickey and Donald and, and, and all of those characters. But on the flip side of the coin, they had all of their feature stuff going on. So, um, you know, for, for the 10 years, uh, the Silly Symphony series, um, which is, you know, 75 animated short films. So Disney became a massive factory out of nowhere they've you know they've 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 done steamboat willy um and then they're doing this so it's like a massive leap um they were just short whimsical pieces of animation with that were in color and there was sound and um they made you know in in that 10 years they picked up seven oscars which is astonishing but also at the same time, they got into making high-end feature films. So, you know, 1937, they made Snow White, which was a massive innovation. You know, it was the first feature-length cell animated film, um, you know, released in sort of 37, 38. And then from there on, they got onto a roll. And I sort of stopped it there because I was starting to get into an era that I didn't have time to, to complete. And I'll, I'll do that next week or, or following week. But you can see they just started making these high-end feature films year after year after year, um, which was astonishing. The level of output was amazing. Whilst at the same time, they're still doing these, these things called the silly symphonies, you know, these little kind of throwaway whimsical little things, which is, which is really kind of interesting. Um, also, at the same time, oh yeah, here's another, here's another piece of technology. Um, during Snow White, they invented this thing called the multi-plane camera. Now, Disney pioneered this idea. So traditionally, you would have a rostrum camera, which is a, a suspended camera that looks down upon a flat surface. And you've got a whole bunch of peg bars and glass and things like that. So you've got this flat plane and you assemble the artwork on, on the cells. And you, know, you, you, you put it all there and you go click, click, and then you pull all the drawings off and put the next drawings down, click, click, 
and you assemble the movie. And that's certainly, you know, what most of most of my animation career was around working in and around those those rostrum cameras. Now, Disney did this interesting thing where they made these multiple planes so that the artwork was on essentially on clear cell and you could see the artwork below and they could pull focus and they could um, slide bits of artwork between. So it just gave this really sort of surreal um, idea of 2D, 3D. Um, really interesting piece of technology, really important. And I've got this excellent little film, again, you should watch it. And it's actually uh, Walt himself explaining how the multi-plane rostrum camera works. So I remember seeing this when I was at uni um, and it's definitely something you should see. Okay, in parallel to um, the Silly Symphonies, um, along comes Warner Brothers and from 1930 all the way through to about 1969, which was you know, the golden age of American animation. Um, Looney Tunes was produced by, by Warner Brothers. Now Warner Brothers was doing the feature films, just like Disney was getting into, into feature films. Warner Brothers was a, 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 a live action feature, very much part of the, the whole Hollywood film uh, industry, but they, had this strange department, they called it Termite Terrace, and it was way out on the back of the lot, they, they gave it to, um, um, they gave it almost no respect at all, you know, they really, they, they didn't really care about their, uh, their artists, but all they wanted them to do, the brief was to produce six minute short pieces of animation. And um, they were given six weeks to produce each one. So they just bang these things out, bang, 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 um, week after week. And they had these characters like Bugs Bunny and Daffy Duck and all those characters that we know, you know, Marvin the Martian. And the reason they did this and, and why they didn't really give them the same respect that the feature films were getting was because they produced these animated shorts to show at the start of their movies whilst people were arriving and getting themselves a chop top and, and, and finding their seats, that they had these shorts there to kind of warm the crowd up. And they never ever expected, you know, Bugs Bunny and, and, and Daffy Duck and, and, and to, to be as popular as they were. They were just pieces of throwaway kind of just rubbish. Um, they didn't really respect their animators. But over time, you know, they became really popular. We have, you know, legendary animators like Tex Avery, um, who did all of that really like crazy slapstick um, kind of animation that's sort of we've become really familiar with it. But Tex Avery was the guy that invented all of that stuff and, and innovated that. And people like Chuck Jones, who uh, animated. Um, uh, Bugs Bunny um, and you know Mel Blanc doing the voiceovers so um, yeah so that was in in, 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 in in conjunction with what was happening with, with the Disney Studios then I realised I've been talking too much so that's it how long have I been talking for? an hour and a half bloody hell any thoughts, any questions? Sarah got off Yes, yeah, she's gone. Is anyone there? Yeah, I am. Who <laughs> <laughs> is that? It's good. It's all interesting. Yeah. I, I, I've got to say, I loved kind of researching all of this stuff. So I did it when I was at school and I just hadn't really sort of delved into it for a while. It was really a really nice reminder. And I was going to do it all in one, one hit and I went, so much and I was sort of going down these little rabbit holes and this is important, this is important. Um, there's a lot of stuff for, for you to watch there and what I'd like you to do is just to get, download this um, this presentation and just have a noodle around and just start going, going on a bit of a wander and just sort of 
of seeing it. I think it's important that you see it and understand the relevance. Um, you know, it, it, it's going to form where you're going, you know, who knows where you're going. And it's, it's kind of interesting when you see those, those moments of innovation, you know, in the 1920s, 1927, you know, there's, um, you know, they're learning how to map things out and optically print and composite film for the first time and cut elements out, you know, traveling mats and glass shots and all of that. And just this high level of innovation that we take for granted now. They didn't know where it was going. Now it's like, bang, you've got sound. And we think now, well, where's it all going? What, what, where, where do you think your industry is going to be? You know, I, I, I feel like a, a part of history. Like as I said, it's like I sort of feel like this, this tiny, tiny kind of connection all the way through to Buster Keaton that, I've sort of realized and I went, where is your, where, where is you, where, where are your careers going to go? You know, it's, 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 it's a fantastic thing. Um, and really exciting because, you know, if we think about all of that innovation, you, you guys are going to see so much. Um, and it's so exciting for you. What are your thoughts? I'm excited. I'm excited to watch all the videos that you put in all the links. Cool, and I want to know what you thought of them as well. So, so you know, next week, come back and, and, and tell me. Yeah, cool, cool. Hollywood certainly is. Hey, Mark, I didn't know you were sitting there. <laughs> I would love to be someone back in the 20s or 30s and actually be able to experience that innovation. Like, I want to know what their thoughts were and, like, how they acted. That'd be cool to know. And it's not just because of all the crazy drugs they had? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to think it's not just the drugs, to be honest. <laughs> It was just an interesting time. The, the First World War was massive. Um, so, so, uh, in, a, in a sort of a, a socio uh, way, because it, it changed everything forever. You know, it was like uh, this sort of um, mass destruction had been industrialized. And that had never happened on that scale before. And so people were highly traumatized. And they, the 1920s was a period of time where people separated themselves from the past. So you, you see, I, I love that period of invention because they were, they, you know, typefaces changed, clothes changed, architecture changed, music changed, the way people thought changed. Um, so you're right, yeah, it'd be great like to have a time machine to go back and go, what were you doing? What were you thinking? It'd be fascinating. Yeah, it's cool. I like it. The twenties the twenties are a good time. They interest me. I like them. Yeah, they are. And the interesting thing about them is that occasionally they get referenced um in fashion or in music or you know, we, we sometimes kind of go back and have a look at it and go, what was going on there? That kind of that modernist idea. Um, and it's really, the great thing is <laughs> that I find is that I've been around kind of long enough to have seen um, lots of innovation. Like I said, I was sort of, inv you know, you know I've, I've sort of seen the past, if you know what I mean. Um, I'll tell you this weird story. I was, I was working in this animation studio and um, it was late in the afternoon and they said to me, oh, look, we had, we had a stop frame animator to come in and do a, a quick job for us overnight. We've booked this camera at this, at this, um, at this studio and um, they wanted to have, you know, you know, those little station idents for, for MTV, you know what I mean? When they sort of like, when you're watching like a little, little station ident of you know, like the MTV logo kind of comes in and does something. Yeah. And they said, oh, look, we had this idea and we were, we've been commissioned to do uh, a station ident for, for MTV. And it was made out of all of these little kind of little, little I think it was like little models made out of out of stuff, something or other, like bits of cut paper and things. 
And they said, oh, the animator can't show up. Um, can you do it? And I went, yeah, yeah I'll do it. Yeah, it was, and lo- those jobs were just coming through all the time. They were just like everywhere. And so I got to this studio and said, oh, look, you know, it was about, about six o'clock at night because they get, they could book the time cheaper on the cameras in the evenings. That's why they do it. And so I got there and this, they had this camera and this thing was this, this big black box. And I went, oh, all right, this thing looks pretty old. And the the camera operator was, was there, and he said, because he, he had to show me how to use it before he went home for the night, and I had to stay up, stay there all night to do this thing. And he said, you know, he showed me all the buttons to push, and it was really analog. And he said, oh yeah, it was used on a Charlie Chaplin film. And I went, what the fuck? <laughs> I'm using a camera that was used on a Charlie Chaplin film. That's insane. But. Anyway, there you have it. What, what else have you guys got? I tell you guys stories I think blow my mind. And I don't get any kind of facial reactions. <laughs> it's just like, I'm expecting you like, oh my God, that's amazing. Nothing. Dinner's ready, guys. You have to go. All right, I better make sure I record this.